Hello and welcome aboard to this episode of the We Are Reading One Piece podcast. This is a podcast dedicated to following the entire story of One Piece from beginning to end as we focus on one volume each episode. We keep the discussion spoiler free for new fans of the series, so this is the perfect place to follow along whether you're new to the series or just want to revisit the world of One Piece with us. This week we will be covering volume 29 Oratorio, which covers chapters 265 through 275. My name is Joel, and I'll be your host. And joining me today, we have Evan. Hello. <laughs> yeah, so the dynamic duo this week. Uh, but Sean did give us uh, a little gift. He gave us uh, some summaries, so we'll be reading those um, later on in the episode. But for right now, uh, let's just dive into the recap from the last volume. Wiper committed to taking down Enrio at all costs and led his warriors into battle, knowing that not all of them may survive. They ran to Vassal Shura, who managed to trap all the warriors at once with a string challenge. Wiper managed to avoid the string clouds and took Shura out with a blast from a powerful reject dial. The gold hunting members of the Straw Hats were separated by the large Anaconda attack and countered adversaries of their own. Luffy had a brief confrontation with Wiper that ended in a bazooka battle before Luffy found himself stuck in a strange cave. Zoro defeated the Shandian warrior Braum with the flying slash attack, and Chopper outsmarted Vassal Gadatsu in his own swamp challenge. Robin struggled to defend the ruins as Commander Yama showed no respect for the history of the surroundings. Kabikiri came face to face with Kami Enru himself and quickly came to the shocking realization that Enru wielded the power of lightning, as he was able to take out a large number of people all at once. After defending the Mary with Gonfor from Kotori and Holtri, Konos and Pagia arrived with Isa along, um, along with Nami's repaired waiver. And we pick up uh, pretty much right there <laughs> as we dive into chapter 265, Pirate Robin versus Heavenly Warriors Commander Yama. Nami tests out her newly repaired waiver, which Pagia explains was equipped with a rare jet dial. They decide to proceed with moving the Mary to the meeting spot as planned, as Nami assures that her friends are unbeatable. Isa points out that there are no groups of four remaining, as she can sense them using her mantra. As she begins to cry from being scared, Konos explains that they found Isa along the way, being attacked by a skyfish after her waiver had broken down. Elsewhere, Luffy continues to explore the cave for a way out while Zoro fans off a large south bird from taking his lunch. Enrio works on thinning out the remaining survivors, leaving 24. Robin realizes that she won't be able to fight Yama and defend the ruins at the same time, so she creates some distance by moving the battle. Now unburdened, she is able to freely fight back. She swings Yama into a tree using her powers and turns his belt of axe dials back on him. Yama begs for for, uh, forgiveness, but Robin does not grant it. Showing no remorse, Yama tries to attack Robin again. Robin stops him in his tracks, then rolls him off a cliff with a trail of her arms and finishes him with the clutch. All right, so what'd you think of this one? Um, it's so awesome getting to see Robin fight. I feel like, you know, she's the one character who we haven't really seen in action a whole lot. So it's really cool mm. getting a fight scene with just her fighting solo, <laughs> um, against Yama, who's a pretty formidable opponent. Um, but it's just cool seeing her using her devil fruit and outwitting her opponent. Um, and there's also a point where we see kind of like in the opening attack where she kind of swings yama into the tree and kind of uses yama's own force against them Mm. um she comments he's so heavy um so i feel like that kind of lends me to believe that maybe the arms that she is able to create only have so much strength as her arms in real life right yeah i I think that's that's exactly her arms yeah exactly so each arm is as equal to a regular arm of her own. So she's got super strength, so she can only handle what she can with a regular arm. Mm -hmm. But when she combines a few of them, you know, they can kind of work together, but there is a limit to like how much like, you know, one, one arm could really bear. So. Yeah. So it's kind of cool seeing that, seeing her reach that limit and knowing that that's kind of the thing. Um, But yeah, that was super fun fight sequence. Yeah. I feel like every time we see Robin use her powers, it's used like in a different creative way. Like, mm-hmm. like in a way that we haven't really seen before. So like it seems like there tends to be like more and more of this power. Like we take a little bit at a time. So like 
when the first time we've seen it, like we didn't know like the extent of like how much she could really do with it. But I feel like she's really stretching like how much you she's getting out of the powers. So it goes like beyond just her arms. We can see like different limbs. We've seen like use like eyeballs. So like there's a lot of like creative ways that yep. she's using the power. Yeah, it was very cool getting to see that. Some more of that. Uh, and then uh, last last um, episode, we did also see that it seemed like Robin was kind of struggling against uh, Yama, so we weren't really sure how she was actually going to be able to handle him. Mm -hmm. So it seemed like she she was holding back because she was more concerned about the ruins, so she wasn't going all out. But we see now that right. she, yeah, was she was able to concerned. kind of go all out. Yeah. Yeah, she was able to handle and defeat him. Yeah, that wasn't that wasn't too drawn out. <laughs> and then we also little... oh, oh, go oh you go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> I was just gonna comment on um Ice as a mantra ability. Like we get a little bit more of a sense of how in tune she is with everyone's mantra and how much it's affecting her. Yeah. Obviously, like being able to know where everyone is and like a war is raging around them. And so like she's very directly aware of you know what's happening and the amount of carnage that's going on in the upper yard so um i'm curious to see how that kind of like ties into the story later on hmm. she's clearly a pivotal character in this plot yeah and um i just thought of something to like a correlation that i had with um a star wars book i had read uh recently called brotherhood um mm -hmm. So again, like kind of connecting to like the force, like how that, yep. that how that works. There's a character in that story who's like overwhelmed by the force because she can hear like so much all at the same time. So that kind of reminds me of Isa in this case too, where like she can just like she 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 hears like all this going on and she's like hearing voices like like fade out and she knows what that means. So right. like it's like pretty terrifying to her to like hear like all these voices going out like so so quickly in such like a short period of time. Yeah, that's pretty intense. And um, we do see that uh, Nami's labor that they found uh, had a jet dial, which seems to be not very common up here. So we've seen a jet dial where Gadatsu uh, had the jet dials, but it seems that like it's not really a common one that like a lot of people have. So it's kind of fortunate that cool. that she does have that. Yeah, that's awesome. I hope the waiver makes it through. Yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love how she's just so like naturally good at like naturally gifted on it. Yeah, that's a fun detail. Yeah, her own like natural abilities, um, just really like lend itself to like to navigating it, like the like the waters and everything. So she knows how that works. So um, yeah, it's cool that she's able to apply it in this way. Yeah. Um, I think Zoro's interactions with the South Bird are pretty funny. Uh, <laughs> so he, he like he gets mad that the South Bird is like following him, and then like Zoro thinks he's like trying to fight him. <laughs> yeah, I wish Zoro could put this together because he knows what a South Bird is and he knows why <laughs> its head is pointing that direction. <laughs> and he's still like, "Why is your neck like that?" <laughs> Come on, Zoro. We've been through this. Yeah. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, meanwhile, Luffy's just kind of wandering this cave, kind of, kind of clueless. <laughs> Classic. So I kind of feel like this is another one of those types of moments um, where Luffy's kind of taken off the um, out of play for a little bit. So he's not like interacting with like the main story, what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've seen this like in the past. Where Luffy just kind of like gets stuck in stuff, like you know, like Arlong Park, he got stuck uh, in the cement, and they got stuck in the water. So, <laughs> yeah, I was gonna bring this later up, like during like more of the battles. Like I feel like yeah, mm. Luffy's usually incapacitated during like the build up to the boss battle. Yeah, <laughs> and then usually like makes his appearance at like the last possible moment. You know, like, <laughs> I feel like that's kind of been a trend that's happened for the past few arcs. Yeah. <laughs> Which is fun. It kind of, I mean, it kind of gives everyone a, a time to shine and then leads up to like the ultimate boss battle, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. I feel like Dragon Ball did that a lot too with Goku. Yeah. Like they they, they sure. always find a way for like Goku to not be involved with the fight right away. Uh, so they would delay it. So, like, yeah. Perpetual. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Again, Robin's fight was so good. 
I also love her yeah. composure and like how, you know, she led Yama out and then she like very calmly, like, you know, takes her backpack off, takes her hat off, sets them neatly in a pile. And it's like, okay, <laughs> let's do this. Like, let's, let's yeah. throw down. Um, yeah. I don't know. And her whole, her vibe, this whole, uh, volume is cool. Cause I feel like she kind of has this like Indiana Jones archeologist adventurer <laughs> kind of, you know, um, suave kind of, uh, personality. And it had to yeah. be. Yeah. She doesn't really get shaken up by a lot of things. Like when, even like yeah. there's like life threatening situations, like she seems to keep like level head about it. Like, you know, we saw like earlier when there were, um, out out at sea with like uh Masra and they saw like the, the giant like turtle showing up like you know she's she has like a kind of a morbid like perspective of things but she's not like like worried or concerned about like really yeah. like, like what's going on. So yeah she she just seems to have that kind of air about her which I, I really respect. Totally. Similar similar to Zoro in a way. I feel like Zoro is also one of those people who's not easily rattled and kind of keeps his head in, in like battle situations, maybe not battle situations, situation, yeah. but like, but in like, in like, in yeah, intense situations or life threatening situations, he seems to keep it cool. Yeah, he gets excited about that, like the prospect of fighting sometimes. Yeah, for sure. Or frustrated at a at a south bird in the jungle. When he's yeah, <laughs> kind of, easily frustrated. Cool. But but when it comes yeah. to battle, like yeah, he, he's all good. <laughs> All right, uh, ready to move on? Yep. All right, so we got chapter 266, Pirate Chopper versus Vassal Ohm. The summary is brought to you by Sean. <laughs> <laughs> With Yama dispatched, Robin gets back to what she does best, exploring ruins and ancient history. As she walks through the ruins below Giant Jack, she notices that the topography doesn't match up with the map. Consulting her notes, she seems to come to a shocking conclusion. But first, we cut the chopper, who is determined to reach El Dorado first by climbing Giant Jack. At the top, he discovers more ancient ruins, as well as, as, well as the massive hound Holly and his master Ohm, the last remaining vassal of Eneru. At first, Ohm remains calm and passive, telling Chopper not to be afraid, as he is mourning human frailty. He questions why humans keep destroying one another, how they long for happiness but fight regardless. He supposes that it's simply their nature, but resolves that there is a solution. He decides they must all die, which Chopper finds to be quite frightening solution. Ohm decides he will save Chopper too, but Chopper takes issue with this particular method of rescue. <laughs> we cut again to Rocky kneeling over Kamakiri's terribly burned body. The man clings to life, but implores Rocky to stop Wiper from trying to face Eneru, who claims to be invincible. Rocky promises she will, leaving Isa's bag with the wounded man before rushing off toward the temple. Meanwhile, we see Zoro seemingly back at the sacrificial altar. Did he go in a circle? <laughs> no, he thinks it's just a similar looking location. The South Bird laughs at Zoro, who does not take it well. Spotting his bag and mistakenly assumes there is food inside, the bird takes off into the air with it. But not before Zoro grabs onto the bag and is taken along with it. Elsewhere, we find Luffy walking to the end of the passageway, assuming it might be a trick door. He launches a gum gum bazooka at the wall, but nothing changes. Suddenly, the ground seems to erupt by his feet and he is tossed around like a ragdoll. Finally, we return to Chopper, who is running in terror from Ohm. The doctor decides he needs to escape and regroup with the Straw Hats, and assumes that since Ohm fights with a sword, he should be okay if he keeps his distance. But moments after he imagines this, Chopper is sent flying and bleeding by a blast of energy from Ohm's sword. The bespectacled vassal claims that Chopper is in the Iron Challenge, and there is a survival rate of 0%. Not liking those odds. No, not looking good. <laughs> you never tell me the odds. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> well, we've gotten the odds for every other battle, and they've all been, you know, brutal, but not yeah. zero. Well, Swamp Challenge was like 50%. So that, that, that was oh, a lot was better it? comparison. That's, yeah, <laughs> That's not so bad. I forget that's what Satri's was. I feel like it was like probably 25% or something like that. 
<laughs> that's hilarious. But zero percent is a real good track record for Ohm. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough challenge. Poor Chopper. Um, I love when Chopper finds out that information, um, <laughs> and in his shock, his hat flies off. But his <laughs> ant- his antlers also fly off of that. You caught that? Yeah. Oh, that was so funny. <laughs> love that yeah that, that makes it seem like the antlers are attached to his hat, <laughs> to like, hat. Like, but they're they're not like it, it's actually part of his head but it's just like a uh, visual gag i know i thought that was, I, I thought yeah. that was absolutely hilarious yeah i do remember i think the first time through the series um i i did wonder if that was like the case where it's like wait are the antlers part of the hat like why did they come off but mm-hmm. like that's not the case yeah <laughs> Yeah, and this is a pretty pretty tough because Chopper's going from Gadatsu, who we saw was a little bit of a goofball, to mm-hmm. Ohm, who is a lot more serious. Even like his philosophy is a lot more serious and dire. Yeah, uh, and then his fighting style is a lot more ruthless. I think. Yeah, it was pretty intense. And those odds, man, the odds don't lie. <laughs> is this the sec? This is the second time we see Luffy fall through a or no? Is it? Um, let's see. Oh no, never mind. I am mistaken. I know now, but I think I wrote that as like a comment when I was reading through the first time. Oh, okay. So like Luffy goes like falling after he attacks yeah. the uh, the wall. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> he gets the, he gets the, the end, and he's like a dead end. The end. <laughs> <laughs> he starts patting it. <laughs> oh my god! So good. <laughs> um we also got a little tidbit that um the rumble rumble fruit is the most powerful login type did i say that right did i pronounce it uh, right? so, so it's a uh, logia logia mm-hmm. oh shit i just wrote that down wrong <laughs> yeah so it's <laughs> l-o-g-i-a which is the third type of devil fruit that we now have a classification for. Okay. So is that three for three now? That's three for three. Cool. Yeah, so the Logia types are typically going to be more like elemental in nature, uh, where like their body can physically turn into like the what the um, the embodiment of the fruit is. Cool. So we're talking crocodile, smoker. Like you said before, Ace. Ace. No, I don't know. So you can see like um, how like their bodies like become like, intangible when they go into that mm-hmm. state. So is is Luffy also that type? So Luffy is not. Luffy's not. Yeah, so his would fall under Paramecia. So Luffy's a, a little tricky in a way because Luffy's body is rubber but it's he's not turning like into like a rubber state his body is just kind of always rubber it's a constant state yeah um and it's i think it's more similar to like albeda's devil fruit where like her skin turned like smooth like the smooth smooth fruit so mm-hmm. like things like would like slide for skin so i think it's more it's more close to that because like albeda is also not like a logia type um, Logias typically tend to be more like, like more like, elemental in nature. Hmm. So would Buggy be that because he can like separate his body parts, or is he more like Luffy because he's a solid state, but he can just manipulate? Yes, yeah, so I would say he would fall under Paramecia. You like Paramecia? Okay, cool. Neat. And then the third type is uh, Zone. Zone. So which zone. we saw is like animals. Cool. And those would typically so have yeah, three different missing... forms. Gotcha. So that was the missing. Logia was the missing one from last last. That week. was the missing one. This. Yep. Sweet. Three for three. Yeah. So <laughs> now it's good that we know what, what to actually call them now. Uh, I I didn't realize that they were both explained in this arc. So I'm mm-hmm. glad that they uh, they did address them. Although they did it in like a very like kind of subtle way. They didn't really explain what they were, but they did mention them at least. Yep. 
Yeah, I mean, we can just kind of put it together. That's cool. I do think it's interesting that Rocky knows that it's a devil fruit and what it is. Like she, she's familiar with the rumble rumble fruit. Mm-hmm. I think um, Robin is also familiar with the terminology because I think she says it later in this arc. Mm, I, yeah, I think she recognizes it too. Yeah. So I, yeah, I don't know how common knowledge devil fruits are or like what they are, but it seems like Wiper is also familiar with devil fruits and mm-hmm. uh, the types because he recognized Luffy was a paramecia. That's why he called him paramecia type when you saw him that's earlier. Right. Yeah. Right, right, right. So that's how that one came up. So even though they're they're up here in the sky, they're they're pretty familiar with uh, the devil fruits. Yeah. Although shocked because I feel like I feel like especially Wiper when he realized he was kind of it was like a shocking realization. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, it seems that they're they're probably less common up here because uh, they typically are relying on dial power. It's usually how like a lot of the fights are conducted up here. So there's not too many devil fruit users. And I do think it was uh, funny that Zoro ended back up at the altar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So he, he, went, he, now he went the opposite direction. Yeah, he went exactly like the, the wrong direction, um, the opposite direction he should be going. He ended up back at the starting point. So good. <laughs> Classic. But he did catch a break with the, the South Bird, uh, taking him up into the air. So that way yep. he didn't have to like try to walk and navigate his own way back. <laughs> Was there anything else in the chapter that um, that caught your attention? Uh, no, I think I think that's about it. Yeah, I just think uh, Ohm uh, gives us uh, like his unique take on things. Um, yeah. He seems to be a little like a little serious in a way. Uh, we we briefly mentioned it earlier, but like, yeah, he he's like kind of like humans are a lost cause and. Like I, like I feel bad for them, but mm-hmm. the only way to put them out of their misery is to like kill them. So that that's the only solution. That's that's my goal in life now. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a nihilistic view on life, mm. right there. Yeah, and then also talking about the the vassals in the SPS, we did get a brief mention of them having ties to Buddhism. Mm-hmm. So to go down the list, um, Gadatsu is the concept of freeing oneself of earthly problems in Buddhism. Uh, Shura is the realm of the semi-divine in Buddhism. Satri is enlightenment in Buddhism. Uh, Yama is the lord of the afterlife in Buddhism. Um, and they also... Um, yeah, so they didn't seem to really catch where Om comes from. But Om is a sacred symbol in, in Hindu. And I, I believe it's like um it's like supposed to be like the sound the universe makes or something. When like everything's kind of in harmony. Um but like Om Om is kind of the, the chant that you would typically hear in Buddhism that's kind of meant to I think symbolize that concept. Yeah, it was cool that we got a breakdown of that. So I think that adds a little to the the story yeah no yeah those are fun tidbits like the sps does have some gems in there yeah yeah i feel like it's gotten back on track after going off the rails a little bit it went really off the rails (laughs) (laughs) so yeah hopefully we'll get more interesting questions uh you know as we go on for sure All right, do you want to give us your next summary? Let's do it. Chapter 267, March. Isa abandoned ship in order to save everyone, but Nami ain't having it. Just then, the giant hairy catfish tiger python appears and sets its sights on the merry go, when suddenly the snake writhes in pain with a vicious tummy ache. Perhaps some bad shrimp, or maybe they ate something a bit rubbery. The snake rampages into the forest where we hear them referred to as the ruler of the sky. Looking up, the snake sees a tasty morsel floating overhead and leaps up to take a bite, but narrowly misses. Thank goodness, because that tasty morsel was Zoro, dangling below the southward. 
who, not wanting to become a morsel themselves, chucks Zoro. Joe. <laughs> Zoro lands atop Giant Jack, where he is met by a fearsome force of formidable foes. Zoro versus Skybreeder Ohm and his huge hound Holly versus Wiper, the Shandian warrior, versus Sky Knight Gampor versus Ruler of the Sky, <laughs> Serpent, and their tumultuous tummy tremors. Doom. <laughs> Quite the face off. Yeah, things are getting pretty chaotic over here. <laughs> also, thank God that that snake got a name because I was like trying to, like, it was called Serpent, Python, like, Anaconda, <laughs> like, they called it every snake there is. So yeah, now, now we can call it something specific. Now we can call it something, yes. Perfect. Which is a pretty cool name, too, Rule of the Sky. Yeah. Yeah. If you had to pick a name, that's, that's a good one. Yeah, sure. Enru takes uh, offense to that, though. Mm. I'm sure. <laughs> there can only be one Kami. <laughs> yeah, so we uh, we have a pretty good idea of where Luffy is now. <laughs> yes, it's all coming together. Um, it also starts off with another like active um, heroism or attempted heroism from Isa. We were as we were just talking about, like it's obviously having a really strong effect on her. Mm. And I think that, you know, it shows some real courage for her to jump off the ship and, like, be ready to go save her people. You know, I feel like it just shows a lot of um, uh, determination, even maybe misplaced, but, you know, you feel you really feel for her in this scene. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Nami up to this point hasn't really seemed too sympathetic to her. Mm hmm. But yeah, you know, she's she's not about to like let the little, little kid like, you know, get hurt. Right. Yeah, it's nice to see Nami jump in, and then get chased away immediately <laughs> and separated from everyone again. Yeah, you know, paths are converging. That's for sure. Yeah. And then it ends in this like really epic. Um, full page like character breakdown which we've talked about it before what it does so well just like the one liner from each character kind of giving their little spiel yeah and then and then we get a full page of like the band cover with everyone in it ready to go. <laughs> yeah it's so cool so everybody's cool. ready everybody's ready to throw down yeah it's a great even the rule of this guy <laughs> Full page, yeah. <laughs> Who also has so like a, a moment on, on the page before, like Jula. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I was curious what sound that actually is. Um, but like Luffy's inside, um, you know, punching at like, the, the stomach. You know, <laughs> like what's with this cave? Yeah. And the snakes just like freaking out. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, so good. Yeah, it's just funny because like they all like ended up in, like in this area coincidentally. Like right. Zoro, like we're just talking about like was in the completely opposite direction. Now he's over here. Luffy <laughs> happens to be in the snake that's now over here. Um, like you know, uh, Wiper and um, Gompor ended up here. So like, yep. yeah, it's just all, all crazy stuff. Pretty epic face off. And then we also get um, another uh, musical related chapter name, a march. Mm. It's like a type of musical piece. So we're going to see uh, quite a few of those oh, in this nice. volume. It's coming up. Yeah. So I think it's kind of like um, like a march into battle. Like, you know, maybe you can hear like uh, like drums kind of like preparing for like, you know, the upcoming fight. Yeah. The chorus of Jula la 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 <laughs> from uh, Ruler of the Sky. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. Like, I noticed that they were themed, but I didn't really, like, die. I didn't really think about them much mm. deeper than that. Like, the actual march into battle. I like that. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know if I could really explain all of them, but I know I know there's quite a few that are tied musically, but I, I haven't found the theme as to how it relates to the chapter itself in all of them. So maybe as we mm -hmm. talk about it, it might come to me, but 
Yeah, I, I'll, I'll try to plant what I can. One, there's another one I'm noticing that has a direct reference. Well, yeah, yeah. we'll get there. That's all I really got. Yeah. It's all build up to this to this epic battle. Um, just one other thing was um, gone for. You know, makes his um, arrival. And he talks about how the Kami's temple, there's no point going there now. Oh, he says yeah. it was tragic. Everything was destroyed. And Rue was not there, of course. He was sending a message that he no longer has the use for the temple. So you could see, like, the, you know, the temple's been destroyed. There's, like, you know, people on the ground. Uh, so Enru has um, been, like, we yeah, haven't done with this place. No, just wipe my hands, moving on. This plot is in motion. Which... We'll, we'll get more details of that coming up. Mm-hmm. All right, ready to move on? Yep. I love the cover art in this next one. It's like this cool, serious photo of Robin with like, and then there's a little like seal in the corner, like <laughs> with like the, the ball. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Just like a goofy little character in the corner. I, I do really like this one. Um, Cause this it's, it's got one. Like, like, like a, like a castle in the background, like bats. And then there's yeah. like a wolf, so yeah, it's right? kind of like, like it's all um, themed minus the seal. <laughs> yeah, it's like kind of got, um, like gothic. Yep. And then like Robin has a shirt that says dark on it. Yep. And then like you said, there's just like a seal, like kind of <laughs> <That> random <laughs> like, seal. Why is the seal here? There's like no water. <laughs> I do love these though, and there there's some really good ones in this uh, yeah volume. Some cool little just like cover art, chapter art. Yeah, this one in particular is really cool. Yeah. All right. Chapter 268. Sweet. It's a battle royale. Every man for himself at Zora, Wiper, Gonfor, Ohm, and Holly fight. Zora is surprised to see Holly as a hand to hand fighter. Robin discovers that the ruins continue below the clouds and starts digging her way down. Back at the fight, Zora is startled to find Chopper unconscious on the ground nearby. While he's distracted, he steps on a trap which n- uh, nicks him with a barbed wire cloud. Ohm taunts Zoro as he tends to his fallen comrade. Nami escapes on the waiver as she evades the attacks of the Heavenly Warriors. As Robin further explores the ruins and comes across the city of Shandora, she takes a moment to admire the sight. And then another musical chapter, like we just saw about Sweet, which is an mm-hmm. ordered set of musical pieces. I think it's like all the pieces of the puzzle coming together, kind of. Yeah, so typically the suite will be like like different pieces that are kind of set in an order to like, then they're not specifically going to be like part of the same song, but they might like connect to each other in ways or they might like bring something back. But they're, they're typically just going to be like, you know, like, like a set of like pieces together that are considered mm-hmm. to be part of the same collection. Interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't really have any specific tie to the chapter, except for maybe like all the, you know, like we said, like the pieces kind of coming right. together. Like it all, could be more all general these, too, like, they, you know, it can kind of just mean like the chapters of this of this book is, you know, as a suite. <laughs> well, this could be all all the pieces like on the board, kind of coming mm-hmm. together, and making up like this this fight. But that's my best guess. Might be a little Which bit of a stretch. Is quite the battle, it, like <laughs> you said, a battle royale, just like all out. Everyone wants to kill everyone. <laughs> when that dog <laughs> threw a punch, I almost lost it. Because like Zoro's also like, <laughs> and he's got fangs too. <laughs> and then it just shows like a clenched fist of a dog paw, and <laughs> this dog just like throwing this punch. Like the look on that dog's face. Oh god, I thought that was absolutely hilarious. And completely unexpected. Yeah, um, yeah, because like the last was it the last um, chapter or the, the chapter where uh, Chopper fought Om? Like he found like the body on the ground and like he noticed that like he was like slashed up and he thought the dog might have done that. And Om was like, "Oh no, that was me." <laughs> so Holly's Holly's like like a hand to hand fighter, not like so much biting. Oh, that so. was hilarious. <laughs> yeah, and they're not they're not working together. Like all these fighters are. Kind of like doing their own thing. The only, the only thing is maybe Gone for wouldn't be attacking like Zoro in this case because you see him mm-hmm. as a threat. Like Wiper, like has no no discretion. He's like, I, I don't care. Everybody's my enemy right now. Uh, you're you're all in my way to get to Enaru. 
Yeah. Yeah, Wiper and Omer pulling no punches. Yeah. And neither is Holly, literally. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So good. Uh, back to, we were just talking about how cool um, Robin's um, powers are and how she uses them. I feel like this excavation scene is awesome of showing Robin like cutting up the <laughs> ground and then passing it through a series of hands to like, you know, get it out of out of her way. I think that was yeah. super fun and clever. See, again, like every time we see her using her power, she's using it in a different way we haven't seen before. Yeah. <laughs> well, we kind of saw this technique when she was fighting Yama and kind of like yeah. pushing Yama along the ground. Um, yeah. To throw Yama off the cliff. That, that was but similar, still, yeah. yeah. Still so cool, though, to see. I just really like seeing her ability in action. I think it's a fun one. Yeah, she's kind of having like her own little adventure here. Yeah. But she's uniquely qualified so for this type of situation. Like oh, she's yeah. the one who would be able to find information out from the ruins and uh she'd be interested in like these details and yeah. For sure. Yeah, this must be yeah, this is like, you know, the holy grail for her. Like she's in her <laughs> element for sure. Yeah. I feel like Ohm gives up a lot in this chapter, just like verbally, like explaining things. Like he's just giving his opponents a lot of <laughs> info. Like, yeah, there's hidden traps everywhere. Like you can't see them, but they're like hidden throughout and they're triggering these things. I'm like, yo, don't give it all up. Like <laughs> leave uh, some of it to be, you know, figured well, maybe out he's that it. confident because if mm. he's had a 0% 0%. survival rate, it must not make a difference even when the people in the past have found out. Fair enough. And I do like the moment when Zoro notices Chopper on the ground. Because he gets like so concerned mm -hmm. and like he like runs over and tries to help Chopper and then he gets caught in the barbed wire. And then like Ohm's kinda like, Hey, uh stop worrying about your friend, worry about yourself. Yeah, so this yeah. is a great line. This is a great line from Zoro. Um he says, no, I don't like to fight with a motive. And Ohm's like, oh, I see an idealist. And then Zoro's like, I can feel one coming on. <laughs> <laughs> Such a good line. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. I don't know yeah, he, the way motive, he's but holding you're giving the... me one. <laughs> like the way he's holding Chopper is like so sweet. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great moment. Uh, we also get our first look at... Um, Shandora, the lost city of gold, which is also yes. a great full page shot, full page yeah. illustration. Um, really like drives it home. Yeah, yeah. Like just what we're looking at here. Feels kind of like Chicha, Chicha eats in a E. Chicha eats a Chicha eats a. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to correct you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's in. Uh, we'll, it's in, we'll go with yes. It's in Central America. Yeah, it's in. Yeah. Yeah, it does does give like very like, um, like yeah, like kind of Mayan ruins, like cent like Central yeah, America exactly. vibes for sure. Yeah, but yeah, it looks so cool. Like without with overgrown and all like the roots and the cloud, and it's kind of cool how it all comes together. Yeah, and it's subterranean technically. Yeah, which is cool because they're under the lay of the clouds. That's why a lot of people didn't know it was even here because they wouldn't think to look under the clouds over here. Robin was the only one. <laughs> she thought to dig a little deeper. Yeah. I like how um, when Nami's getting chased by the Heavenly Warriors, she's like, why is he saying Ba? Is he a goat? <laughs> <laughs> that would be concerning. <laughs> Well, they are like go people. <laughs> they are go people. <laughs> yeah, I, I just thought that was uh, amusing. Yeah, that is pretty funny. This is a, that's our first time um, running into one of the Heavenly Warriors. Must be. Uh, yeah, I think the first time Nami has, other than like 
you know, running into like Hotary and Kotary. Mm. Oh yeah, they bond too. Mm. They did. They had like the no, they had the whole. They had the whole. Yeah, they, they, yeah, they, they had like the horns. So they in the years. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else on this one? <laughs> no, I'm just looking at the last like battle panel in this chapter with with a uh, Holly just like standing on her on back feet with the like paws up, ready to fight. <laughs> yeah. yeah, put him up. So funny. Put him <laughs> up. <laughs> All right, uh, so let's get on to the next chapter. Chapter 269, Concerto. Cronus and Pagia find themselves unexpectedly defending the Going Merry, as well as the incapacitated Sanji and Usopp at the eastern shore in the upper yard. Pagia blows a horn on his waiver to apparently ward off enemies, while Cronus resolves herself to help Usopp and Sanji recover. Meanwhile, we see the perspective of the remaining Shandians and the opposing Heavenly Warriors as they seek to climb Giant Jack. Rocky internally begs Wiper not to use the reject dial again. It's not good for Enru. Somewhere, Enru laughs and claims that they will all die when they reach the top. Wiper is busy at the moment, firing blasts at Gon 4, while the ex kami tries to reason with the angry Shandian that, uh, that they are allies in this struggle. Wiper will not hear it, claiming that Gonfor is ultimately no different than Enru in his people's eyes. The conflict is interrupted by the giant snake, whose body is unaffected by Wiper's burn bazooka. We briefly cut to Luffy, who gives the illuminating and in-depth explanation of his current predicament, namely that he hates his cave. With that explained, we return to a yet again bleeding Zoro. Ohm explains how deadly his Iron Cloud Sword is and how it will relentlessly pursue its target. The vassal then decides that he and Holly will split up as the battlefield is growing crowded. Sure enough, the ruins are soon joined by the remaining heavenly warriors who resolve to aid Ohm. Soon after, the last three Shandians arrive to help uh, Wiper get to Enru in turn. Luffy tries to dig his way out of the cave. Suddenly, the giant snake starts to laugh. Then, many things happen at once. The Heavenly Warriors attack Zoro, Gonfor and Wiper who each fend them off while Nami and Isa uh, zoom past them on a waiver. Zoro frantically asks why Nami is there. Wiper asks the same of Isa and demands that she gets away with, from the Blue Sea people before taking a shot at Nami. Gonfor swoops in and grabs them away from the blast, only for the giant snake that they were fleeing from to swallow them, all of them whole. Before Zoro and Wiper can react, Ohm and Holly attack the both of them, sending them reeling and wounded. Ohm calls them fools, claiming that they should have never been concerned about the others, as none of them will leave this place alive. Damn. <laughs> Action-packed chapter right there. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't even know where to begin. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, so Wiper has a shot at Nami who has Isa and he takes the shot. <laughs> like, I, I was literally like, yo, what the hell, Wiper? Like, what are you doing? Um, and then I'm about in the, the very first uh, line in the next chapter is the Shandians being like, yo, Wiper, what the hell was that? <laughs> you know, I was like, okay, so I am validated. Like, I feel like that was seemed like a very reckless shot to take from wiper yeah wiper is just kind of like like tunnel visualing like so hard yeah. yeah he's just like um he he has like one thing in mind and that is getting through the, the forces of um of the kami yeah and i get that and, and that's kind of like the the mindset that he's had since the start and he's been very vocal about that mindset too like you know leaving he's like we're gonna leave our comrades behind you know we're going all out this is like a fight for our life you know yeah uh, i do so think I here that, but it definitely um, seemed like a you know. yeah i think here it was just more like a gut reaction i don't think he was actually trying to harm isa um I think it's just that, like, he saw, like, Nami as a blue sea person who he perceives to be a threat. So he's like, get away. And he just kind of blasts at Nami, like, you know, in hopes of getting, like, ice away from her. But, like, 
he's like pretty much ready to like wipe them out and uh gone for has to like save him <laughs> yeah and then they're immediately in by the giant snake yeah which now wiper's concerned about isa <laughs> yeah now he's like oh no yeah <laughs> Yeah, a lot of good action in this chapter. We kind of get to see Ohm's um, attacks with his special sword. Let me get an explanation of how it works, which is cool. Okay, yeah. The Iron Cloud. So it's like, it's like less less of a, a sword, more more cloud, right? Yeah. Zora needs to get one of those. I think it's sweet. <laughs> but I knew this was going to happen. I feel like as soon as we were introduced to a character with a sword, it's like Zoro's going to fight this guy at some point. You know, <laughs> it's inevitable. Like it's, kind of, it's kind of, it's inevitable at this point. Like any villain with a sword is going to fight Zoro at some point. Because, <laughs> you know, if he wants to be the best, he's got to be able to fight everyone. Yeah, yeah this, this one seems pretty sword. rough. Yeah, because yeah. like it's normally like in the sword form, and he says that um, it's an iron cloud and it pursues its target forever, and then it kind of loses its form, and it, it's like more of like a whip type thing, and it comes like yeah, like flying out towards Zoro, which makes it a distance fight, which is not Zoro's strong suit. <laughs> and I like how Zoro's reaction is, uh, "It's like a whip. I get it. The white white <laughs> sea is full of warrior entertainers. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like everybody's got like, a gimmick." <laughs> yeah. They really are though with like all of their <laughs> challenges and shit. Like they're pretty extra. <laughs> yeah, we're really getting down there. I mean, we get like the last of the uh Shandian warriors and the heavenly warriors and yeah. It's really coming down to it. That's like the cool hit place to be now. And then Oh, Luffy starts scratching the inside of the cave, and <laughs> the snake starts laughing, which would be terrifying. If that giant <laughs> fucking snake just started laughing over this battlefield, like, that would be scary. I'd be terrified if that happened. Everybody's confused, like, why is it laughing? Yeah. And we see Luffy, horrifying. like, with, with the rock, like, scratching against, like, the, uh, the inside wall. <laughs> <laughs> he just has to dig his way out. <laughs> Yeah, and then uh, ends pretty pretty roughly when uh, we see Exora and Wiper uh, go down. Yeah, Ohm seems to have gotten the best of them. Yeah, because uh, they're they're, they're distracted, distracted by uh, yeah. their friends all getting eaten all at once. So <laughs> yeah, that's traumatizing. And Ohm sees oh here's an opening like they're distracted, and we take advantage of the situation. Yeah, and he said that a few times, you know, like, don't get distracted by your comrades, kind of. Like. Yeah, he gave him warning. <laughs> yeah, he already brought that up. Um, this one is also a chapter that has a musical element to it. It's called the concerto, mm -hmm. which would be like an orchestra piece where there's a, a featured solo instrument. Who so I'm wondering, solo? Yeah, who, who's got the solo? Ohm? I think Ohm has a solo. For that chapter? I think so. I mean, he was the only one that really, like, had any victorious moves, really. Right? I think that's fair. Because he, he technically would have... I, I would agree with that, because he... I think he kind of won the fight, quote-unquote, in this chapter. Mm -hmm. So, we were compared to, like, there's all these other players before, and Ohm seems to be the one who's kind of standing. So I would say he's, he's kind of the solo person. Unless you don't count, like, Holly. Yeah. I don't know, ruler of the sky, he got a few snacks in there. Yeah, I feel I, like Ohm kind of came out on top of that one. Yeah, I, I'll say that's fair. But I I'd be interested in seeing if other people had like like other interpretations for that, but to me yeah. that, that probably makes the most sense. He does get that final looming doom panel too to to close that, out. That's the a shot. solo moment. That, yeah, that's <laughs> it's time to shine. <laughs> Um, yeah. Okay, uh, let's move on. Chapter 270, Serenade. Zoro and Wiper have been incapacitated. Ohm has the good guys on the fence. 
Quite literally, Holly has triggered an iron cloud fence that encapsulates the battlefield, dubbed the White Vine Cage Match. As Zoro and Wiper get to their feet, Rocky appears from the forest to deliver a message to Wiper. But before she can get her message across, Enru himself appears behind her. She swivels and shoots him with her rifle. The shots land, but bear no damage. Wiper watches helplessly from behind the cage as Enru takes down Rocky with his zappity zap zap technique. Wiper, enraged, enraged, turns his focus on taking down the ruler of the sky, which just so happens to be Zoro's target as well. The two squabble as Holly intercepts them with a furry, furry flurry of fisticuffs. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the cavernous tummy of the serpent, Nami, Gamfor, and Isa are getting their bearings when they come across the bad shrimp himself. <laughs> <laughs> what a place to meet. Like, hey, come here often. <laughs> Oh, cool. You guys found my secret hiding cave. Oh, hey. <laughs> yeah, what's with this cave? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love um, oh. I love this page um, where they find Luffy. And Luffy just looks like um, he's like been through uh, some stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like <laughs> his clothes are like shredded. Yeah, like he, he lost his sandals, like he has like uh yeah, his clothes are in tatters, like a walking stick. He uh he reminds me of like Robin Williams and Jumanji. He's like, What year is it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> like like I like I imagine Luffy having like a giant like beard and like facial hair and stuff now, his hair's all grown out. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> like, Luffy, so you've only been gone for a few hours. How have you like like <laughs> grown so much beard? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's pretty funny. Well, I feel like I we see why Ohm has that zero percent with this cage thing. Like the that's a pretty solid way to you know boost your percentages. Yeah, Literally let's get Ohm ready to rumble, <laughs> rumble, roll fruit, <laughs> rumble, rumble fruit. <laughs> that, that's Andrew's uh, cue. The White Vine Cage Match. <laughs> you guys can't have a rumble without a rumble rumble fruit user around. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's so good. <laughs> um, yeah, I kind of brushed over it in the summary, but we get like this really heartfelt moment with Rocky and uh, Wiper, and like this is the most emotion we see from probably either of them. Yeah, especially Wiper. I feel like Wiper hasn't really like. Like we just were just saying, he's like so in the zone that he hasn't really like, like you said, he's kind of had tunnel vision. But in this moment, we see him kind of become vulnerable and really break down when he sees Rocky, like at the mercy of Enaru. Um And there's really not, there's literally nothing he can do about it because he's caught in this cage. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was one of those like hard to watch moments. Uh, yeah, just like like the moment, like you see like that panel with Enru, where he's like, "Did you call for me?" And he's yeah. just got this look, and it's like, and like Rocky looks and sees, like, you can see like uh, the reflection of Enru in her eye, and it's like yep. you know, like, like it's like so foreboding. She knows too. Yeah. yeah. Ugh. Yeah. And Wiper is just like helpless to do anything. Um. He's like trapped in the cage. You can see like he's grabbing the the barbed wire so hard that like he's his hand, his hands are bleeding. Yeah, I think Odie does a really good job of like driving home that, like you were saying with the close up of the hand on the, like the reflection in the eye, the blood on the hand, and there's like a shot of uh, wipers like the blood coming out of his mouth. Yeah, there's like a lot of cool like little close up. Um. Just makes that scene like a little more intimate and more impactful. Yeah. Like the torch dropping, that whole, yeah, the whole thing. It was well done. Yeah. And then like that panel where you Damn. just see like, like, the, um, it's just like, it's kind of like a far out zoomed out shot of like Andrew, yep. like shocking Rocky. And it's just like a giant crack. And then Wiper just kind of looks on as, uh, as she falls. Yeah. Brutal. 
And meanwhile, like the um, the Heavenly Warriors are trying to attack Wiper. And he's kind of like, not really paying them like, any attention. And he just kind of throws Zero it like, into the cage. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's like, don't, don't waste my time. Yeah, you would think that you would think that Wiper and Zora would at least like somewhat team up. <laughs> would have at least at this point, but they're both so stubborn. Like, you know, I also yeah. can see them not not teaming up just because, um, like I said, they're both really stubborn people. I could see like Zara being more willing to do so, but Wiper seems kind of like not willing yeah, to cooperate with anybody. The first, but... Yeah, I agree. I think Wiper is definitely the first one taking the shot. But Zoro's not gonna go out of his way to be like, "Hey, let's team up. Like, we can be allies here." Zoro will also be like, "Fine by me. I'm I'm cool either way." Yeah. True. True. Man, Holly is hilarious. Like every every <laughs> panel with, with Holly, I think is really funny. Yeah, I do like this. Uh, I look at the panel where um, Holly's going in and going like, "Woof!" and like you can see like, the flip flip with like the Wiper <laughs> and Zoro jumping out of the way. I wasn't even looking at that one, but yeah, I, like I said, <laughs> I every got, panel, yeah. so good. Yeah, I always got some good oh, ones. Oh, yeah. Now I'm looking at it. Yeah. And to stick with the uh, the musical theme, this one's also a musical one, a Serenade. Yes, Serenade. So it's normally like a, like a quiet piece of music, typically to court someone. Mm. So I'm, I'm thinking maybe like it's Wiper and Rocky. Like having like, sure. kind of like, like that quiet, like touching moment. Yeah. And I feel like with, with um, his reaction, if you, if you feel like there might've been some emotions there that are, are deeper than just being acquaintances, you know? Yeah. Maybe not even, not even, maybe not even romantic, but like they definitely had a close bond, you know? He definitely cares for her for sure. Definitely cares deeply for her. Yeah. Cause he went from being like, um, you know, if, if you're not strong enough to fight, like we're leaving you behind. And now he's like desperately like trying to, you know, help her. Yeah. So that's kind of a different attitude that he's had before. Yeah. But, you know, he, totally. she's kind of helpless and he's kind of helpless. And he just can only watch on the horror as she gets uh, shocked. Yep. Yeah. Now we're dwindling down. We're getting uh, closer to only a handful of people. Yeah. The numbers are approaching the prediction. <laughs> slowly but surely all right ready to move on i love that we get a little uh vv cover page on this next one let's see and eyelashes oh, yeah. and uh yep. karu yep nice little uh miss those check in with them yep and we also see uh looks like a fighting dugong on uh vv's jacket Oh yeah, I didn't even catch that. <laughs> That's dope. The kung fu. Oh, it looks like. Um, oh, also, I just noticed um, the shirt hanging on the line has an X. Oh, with the X. So it might be like because of their friendship. Ooh. Yeah, some little some deep cuts there. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's get on to the ball. chapter. <laughs> Is it off a beach ball? Oh no, never mind. Oh yeah, that that does look like the same one that the seal had. Right, I was like, maybe if he's putting a beach ball in all of them, that would explain this random seal with a beach ball. But I don't know. <laughs> all right, chapter two hundred and seventy-one: Pirate Zoro versus Vassal Ohm. Luffy sympathizes that his friends were eaten by a snake, not realizing that he was eaten as well. He's shocked when he finds out he's bitten in the snake this whole time. Luckily, they just need to go to one end to get out, though the others are not on board with Luffy's idea to go out the rear. Outside the snake, Wiper attacks it in hopes of being able to free Isa. Zoro tries not to get skewered by Ohm's weapon as he tries to plot how he can get Nami out. Zoro tries to fight back, but Ohm turns his weapon into a wall to block the attack. Zoro tries his 36 pound Phoenix attack to hit Ohm from a distance, but he deflects it with ease. As Ohm tells Zoro he should start praying to the Kami, Zoro tells him that he would never do that. Zoro decides to put, uh, <laughs> Zoro decides to up his game times three using all three swords for his 36 pound phoenix attack, equaling a 108 pound phoenix. The attack was too powerful for Ohm to handle and is defeated. Let's go. <laughs> so we get an official phoenix. <laughs> we get an official fight between Zoro and the, the sword user Ohm. So good. So good. 
<laughs> uh, love me a Zoro fight. And I feel yeah. like they set this one up really well because of his fight with Satori earlier when he had to use the distance attack. Oh, with uh, Braum? Or sorry, yeah, Braum. When he had to use mm-hmm. um, his, like, a distance attack to fight an opponent who had reach. Um, yeah. And we saw the we saw the 36-pound Phoenix then? Yeah, because he only used one sword. Yeah. So, so he tries again yeah. here. I thought that was a nice build-up because we kind of got the taste of this earlier. I think that was, like, set up nicely. Yeah. So I was like, all right, the one sword didn't work. All right, we got to go with all three. No holding back this time. And I noticed that he put the bandana on his head. Like, did you notice that? Like, I wonder if, does he do that when he's using his three sword style? So um, when he gets, when he runs into the wall, his glasses break and he drops those. And then he puts on a bandana. And then he's wearing a bandana for the rest of the fight. I do feel like he, he kind of puts it on when he's like, like in a serious, in serious mode, the serious fight mode. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess when he's like, all right, like I, I'm also, like, like going down now. Yeah. And I feel like three sword style for him is also that, like, I feel like he doesn't always, he doesn't use three sword style every time he fights. It feels mm-hmm. like, like in this regard, like when he's taking it very seriously, he'll go to three swords. Yeah. Yeah. He, he doesn't immediately jump to it. He kind of like, I think he tries to test the waters yeah, a little bit up. to see. Yeah. Like, how how much he can do without relying on his full strength. Right. Because this is the first time we've seen it this arc. Yeah. Like, he's had the goggles, like, the whole time. Yeah. Yeah, that was a great conclusion to that battle. The long-awaited sword battle. Yeah, and that, that final page is really cool in particular. Yes. Where you can see, like, the slash connect. Yeah, and his sword's kind of, like broken yeah, yeah it does cool. seem like his sword gets broken here like, no, uh, ohm, no. ohm sword he's like he deflected an iron cloud <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like yeah Zora always having to like one up him one up the last uh like cutting what was the last one like cutting through he had like cut through the steel steel yeah now he's cutting through iron cloud hmm from a distance. Now he's like shooting shooting swords. With range. <laughs> yeah. The Phoenix attack is pretty cool. Yeah. Now he needs to go pick up that sword and add it to his arsenal. <laughs> What's about he broke that it? That thing is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, he may have broke it. That's true. That's true. Now that that's like too much of a gimmick for Zoro. He's like, no, that that's not serious. I'm gonna have like a, yeah, like a real sword. <laughs> he's not an entertainer. Yeah. <laughs> like these well, guys. he's entertaining uh, us. I'll, I'll I'll say that. Yes, no, for sure. I always love a good Zoro fight. <laughs> that was definitely the highlight of this chapter. Get some indigestion in the beginning. Oh my gosh, that <laughs> whole opening scene. The whole opening scene with um with Luffy and Nami and like Nami's pulling on Luffy's face. Yeah. Like, Don't, not on not the skin, not the skin. Um like how close Luffy is about the whole shot. situation. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> He's like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry you guys got trapped inside a snake. That sounds awful. Like, no, we're in the snake. You are also with us here in the snake. Um, and then also like a few moments later, they realized that the reason the snake went on the rampage in the first place was because of Luffy. Yeah. And like, there's like that shocked panel, like that shocked reaction panel. Um, I love that. Yeah. With like, like the heavy shadows. Shading. Yeah. yeah. I love it. <laughs> so good <laughs> and the Luffy's like insistent on going out the back <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure he already reached the other end when he, he, did. When he thought there was he like a trap door out. that didn't work yeah. <laughs> and I love um, Nami's reaction was like um, I'd rather be digested <laughs> yeah. and go out the back <laughs> and Gamfor's like blue sea women are barbaric <laughs> Like yeah, he, he also uh, face. he also has um this line uh so you're the captain these must be desperate times <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> oh another great line <laughs> this what passes uh, for a captain nowadays man pirates are really falling huh <laughs> <laughs> uh so good 
Yeah, I think that's about it for me. Yeah, same. Moving on. Moving on. So we are now starting the next cover story. Uh, chapter title page, series number six, Catch the Thief That Didn't Pay the Tab. A Dinah Dasher takes off from a restaurant. <laughs> Good yeah. start. Good start. From Pasta Lake Restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good to me, too. Yeah. I'm down. Okie doke. For the summary. Chapter 272, Play. This summary is brought to you by Sean. <laughs> <laughs> Robin continues to study the ancient ruins, specifically some words written on a wall, which appear to be written in the same script as the ones on the Poneglyph. The only people who could write this way were the same folk who made the Poneglyph. She writes about holding the truth in one's heart and keeping silent, that the people weave history with the reverberations of the Great Bell. Robin remembers mention of this bell in Nolan's log. She summarizes that all the town's books were burned and the entire history of the settlement was erased. The Poneglyph must have been brought here. The city has been fought. The city had fought against the enemy the golden city of Shandora was ruined due to the efforts to protect the Poneglyph. The Great Bell itself is nowhere to be found, however, and Robin again wonders what happened so long ago. Discovering what looked like old cart tracks, she follows the evidence that somewhat that something was moved recently. Sadly, she follows it right toward a laughing Enru. The arrogant Kami claims he discovered this great ancient city, even when his pre predecessors never did. He announces himself as the Kami to Robin and claims to be impressed by her archaeological skills. But she warn she but he warns her the gold is long gone. Robin asks if it was carried away. Enro confirms as much, saying that the glittering precious metal suits him better. She then asks if he took the golden bell as well. But for once, Enru seems momentarily surprised, leading Robin to believe he is unaware of, his exi of its existence. Enru catches on the recall. <laughs> Enru catches on and recalls the story of the island's singing voice. Excited by the idea of a giant golden bell, Enru decides he will search the entire country in the remaining eight minutes before his survival game ends. Before that, he senses a maggot on the edge of the island. Konis and Pagaya are alerted by Sue, spotting an injured warrior of the Kami struggling on the nearby Vars. They seek to heal him, but he begs them most of all to warn the citizens of Angel Island, specifically that Enru plans to kill everyone in the country, not merely the Shandians. Uh, and, and he has an arc, the art Maxim. He and the others were forced to work on it for six years before they can say more. Pagaya pushes a distraught Konis to safety just as the Kami's wrath seemingly obliterates the injured man and Pagaya with him. We cut back to an exhausted but fish victorious Zoro, who is nearly ambushed by Holly before he learns that the giant hound will apparently just obey anyone's commands, even one to knock himself unconscious. <laughs> with that taken care of, Zoro turns to deal with the giant snake and the bazooka man. But before he can make any headway, Enru summons a catastrophic blast of a power from below, tearing the ground beneath everyone's feet apart, causing them and the ancient ruins to fall to the surface below. As Enru celebrates his coming grand finale, Konis is tearfully determined to warn everyone she can about what is to come. All right. Yeah, so... Robin makes um, some some discoveries here, and she uh, draws some conclusions. Um, so she connects that she's seeing the same writing that is written on the pon the poneglyph. That um, she realizes that people here um, who who wrote that like would have been able to read the poneglyph. So um, they must have fought off the enemy that tried to erase their history, and it seems like whoever did that had won because they've been wiped out. Um, so yeah, that, that's important because Robin's connecting um, Poneglyph writing, which is something that is not really something that is common. 
and it has actively seemed to be um, trying to be erased from history. That's crazy. And she was saying like that could even be the reason why um, was she was saying that was the reason why the island might have been launched or the, the land was launched into the sky in the first place? Um, I don't think so. I think that was just um, like, was just like a coincidence. Yeah. But she's saying that she notices like the town's books are all burned and city's history was erased. So the pine glyph was brought to the city, there's no doubt. The city fought against the enemy. So it seemed like um, the, the city was attacked at some point in the past. And um, whoever attacked them like tried to wipe out the history. And um, there's no traces of books left over. Um, yeah, so somebody, somebody had come in here at some point and attacked them. So interesting. Chasing this like erased history and like piecing it together with these old ruins is so cool. Mm, yeah. And yeah, I definitely feel like like you said, Robin is uncovering some some big stuff. Yeah. And she's and one of the only people that the Yeah, that, that would be able to make these connections and realize this. Right. Like anybody else passing by here probably wouldn't think much of this. And with they wouldn't be able to piece these things together, or make those connections, or even like think of like paying attention to this. Yeah, pretty cool. She is in her element. Um, but she also makes the connection with the bell, and like we heard yeah. earlier on, how like, um, well, who said it? I don't know if it was. I think it was either Conus or her father who said like the singing voice is what will save this island. It was like way. It was like really early on, right? I don't remember. I, I know it's mentioned in Nolan's journal, like in the log. They mentioned the great bell, but mm -hmm. yeah, um, I don't know about the. I think it might have been voice. in the beginning when Conus was like playing the harp, and they were like, "This song is gonna okay." Something about a song saving the land or something like that. Hmm. I don't know when the bell came up. Like I remember, I made a connection with that from earlier on in this arc. We have to go back and, and check that out. Yeah, we have out. to go back and check that. Because um, when they said it before, it felt like foreshadowing. And now it's like, you know, kind of coming <laughs> to fruition. Or like yeah. the pieces of the puzzle are starting to come together. But like, um, the bell definitely seems like a crucial part in this, uh, in saving the island. Yeah. And then Robin's noticing where the bell should be. Uh, it's not there. So. <laughs> yeah. And, and, um, Kind of like Sean said in his summary, like that was kind of the first time that the commies kind of been like, huh? Like a golden bell? Like that was mm -hmm. the first time that he wasn't fully aware of everything that was going on. Um, the main but he seems to recall. Is, yeah, he seems to recall that. Oh, actually, no, I think I, I do know what you're talking about. Um, but maybe he but, doesn't realize the significance of it. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, he's he's intrigued that Robin can read the symbols, and he wants to know what Robin found out. And then when Andrew can't really provide more information about the Golden Bell, he says, uh, "Oh no, wait, the bell is here. Uh, it's here. It came to the sky. Uh, Four hundred years ago, when Upper Yard was born. In other words, when this island came flying up here, legend tells of a great bell ringing in the sky. The elders call it the Island Singing Voice. Hmm. So the bell was made of solid gold." So he, he sees it as like something else can, that can be added to the prize pool of the winner, who he mm -hmm. presumes is going to be himself. Yeah, and then we get more details of what Andrew is planning. Yeah, very tragically. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like there's a lot at stake now. Everything's at stake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everything and everyone. Yeah, so um, the survivor um, tries to warn them that Andrew's plan to destroy everything. Now that his Arc Maxim has been built, um, all the other um, followers um, have been disposed of, and we have an escapee who has survived. And he's he's trying to get the word out that like everybody needs to like evacuate because uh, Andrew's going to blow up the entire island. Uh, and Pagaya like realizing what had just had like what just transpired and pushing Conus into the water. Ugh, what an intense moment. Yeah. And like the sacrifice, the sacrifice from 
the guy. Yeah. yeah, you can see like the again like the heavy shadows and like the light the light beam just appears. Yeah. But on a lighter note, um <laughs> it was hilarious how Zora was able to command Holly. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah, that was very funny. <laughs> he like kind of looks at the camera, he's like, You just obey anyone? <laughs> Bang your head and pass out. <laughs> bang your head, bang your head and pass out, and then like he, he uh, does the command. <laughs> <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> uh, so funny. Yeah, it was pretty great. And yeah, then Enru uh, joins the fight himself. It's a great time to make my appearance. Not good. Starts by destroying the battlefield. And part of Giant Jack. Oh, right, here's where Robin, Robin recognizes but... that he has uh, Loki powers. Oh yeah, getting intense. Yeah, it's escalating. <laughs> it's a really cool shot of Zoro post battle, like right at the right after dropping his opponent. Yeah, after just doing the Phoenix move, that like it's like a pretty <laughs> cool stance. Like that whole that whole cell is pretty dope. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's am- ambushed by the dog. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Yeah, so okay, so the the bottom part is destroyed by Enru because they were all trapped in the cage. So by destroying it, I guess Enru freed mm-hmm. them from the bottom. Uh, so it looks like the cage might have been destroyed then too. Because I don't see it there anymore. Yeah, it must have been like below the cage that got destroyed. Well, zero percent stat just got broken. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That perfect streak. Yep. <laughs> Thankfully, he didn't leave, live to see it. <laughs> he's going to be so mad when he wakes up. He's going to be so mad in heaven. <laughs> he's not going to heaven, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> All right, ready to move on? Let's move on. Okay, so next up, we get Ace's Great Search for Blackbeard, Volume 2. <laughs> Sorry about the Dinah Dash. Turns out the Dine Dasher was Porcus the Ace. Checks out. So now we're getting in the Ace cover story. Yes. I'm excited for that. We don't get enough Ace, so I'm excited for so, more. <laughs> more Ace. I get the whole story. And right where I left him, he was looking for Blackbeard, so he's, he's still on the hunt. Apparently he broke because he can't pay for food. <laughs> <laughs> or just chose not to. <laughs> yeah, which is not so surprising now that we see who it is. <laughs> yeah, right. Actually, probably, probably fell asleep in the food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. All right, let's get your summary for the next chapter. Right. Doki, chapter 273, Quintet. Kaboom! The upper ruins fall from the sky. Nami hops on a waiver and plans their escape from the belly of the beast. But unfortunately, Luffy was holding onto the exhaust, leaving himself and Isa behind in a puff of cloud. Ganfor and Pierre are separated, and Pierre circles back for Luffy and Isa. Isa. At the base of the beanstalk, Zoro carrying Chopper is reunited with Robin and Nami and Ganfor. Whipper also survives the skydiving and finds himself in his homeland, Shandora. The ruler of the sky begins to act odd and sheds a tear when Enru catches wind and smites them with a lightning bolt. Enru then hops on a cloud ball and tells the remaining warriors, this is all a big silly game and someone must perish for his prophecy to come true. After a brief sidebar, it turns out no one is in the mood to sacrifice themselves. So they decide it must be Enru himself who shall perish. The last round of tryouts begin who will make it into the quintet? All right. Yeah, another. Uh... That, this one. <laughs> yeah, I figured that one was kind of on the nose. Yeah. <laughs> so that one's a little bit more obvious. So like a quintet would be a, a group of five musicians. Yeah. yeah. Usually like in a, like a chamber setting, like chamber music. That one checks out. Man. It's a good thing they landed on clouds, or that would have been a bloody mess. <laughs> <laughs> like that was not Safe a small, landing. <laughs> small fall. Like yeah. it was Yeah. 
Good thing the ground is made of clouds. <laughs> and of course, of course, Luffy can stay stuck in the beast because as we were talking about before, like Luffy's got to be incapacitated until the last possible moment yeah. <laughs> to come out and have his hero moment, you know? Yeah. Well, I'm a little bit longer, Luffy. <laughs> yeah. Somehow they ought to safe landing, so that's good. Zoro lands like under a piece of rubble and is like lifting up like <laughs> distressed with one arm and Robin's just like, oh, did you come down with the ruins? Like super casual. Like, oh, did you just come yeah. down with the ruins? And I like how of, uh, she, uh, she calls him Swordsman instead of by his name. Mm. And she, she referred to Nami as Navigator. Oh, yeah. I did so, notice that. Yeah, she, she doesn't call her crewmates by their names. Mm, interesting. So it's a little impersonal that She's still way. pretty you know? new. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Total, no, totally impersonal. Yeah. But then I like how after like Zoro gets out from the rubble, he's like, I nearly died. Grr, and he like throws like the 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 piece off of him. And then Robin's like, Yes, you would have died if it were normal. <laughs> <laughs> She's got a point. She's got a point. So like you've been saying throughout the series, like there's something like different about Zoro. I totally. think it's just he's he's just like abnormally strong for somebody in those like yeah. even within the universe he's like abnormally strong, um, but yeah, I, superhuman I, yeah. qualities. <laughs> yeah, this is a cool moment having um, Whipper reunited with his homeland, and also seemingly um, the ruler of the sky serpent. Mm, yeah, also seems to be reunited with uh their homeland as well yeah it's yeah, so, like wiper has like, like that moment and he sing. like looks on and off yeah and then like the, the roll of the sky it seems to be singing yeah. and happy sheds a tear of joy i would assume yeah yeah because it starts crying and andrew having no sympathy is just like um Zero. you're enjoying this too much yeah. again there can only be one rule of the sky <laughs> yep did not like that and it calls him an annoying little snake Man, he's incapacitated a lot of people at this point. <laughs> and then Zoro thinks that Nami is still in, in the snake, and then um, Wiper thinks Ice is still in the snake. So they like freak out when they see uh, the real of the sky gets uh, taken out by Enru. Right. And then Nami's just like off to the side. Oh, you, you're here? You, you escaped? <laughs> <laughs> but then Nami tells Zoro that Luffy was still in there. And like, Zoro's like, what was he doing in there? <laughs> Why is he like this? It's <laughs> pretty funny. Yeah, and then Andrew kind of tells Wiper that, um, yeah, you know, the game isn't over yet, and Wiper's like, he he thinks of this as like a game. So I, like, Wiper's like seeing that Andrew just like sees him as like kind of like pawns like for his amusement. Mm -hmm. It's cool, um, the cloud ball that he makes and sits on. Mm. Reminds me of the air ball from, like, Avatar. Yeah. <laughs> and Nami thinks that um, she was hiding enough that Andrew wouldn't notice her, but uh, she finds out <laughs> pretty quickly that uh, he knows. <laughs> yeah. I think he's got some range with that, uh, that mantra. Yeah. Yeah. You're not fooling him. I like this last panel where that everyone does seem to kind of team up finally. Yeah. After all being like, you want to be the sacrifice? I'm like, nah, no, nah, not really. You want to be the sacrifice? <laughs> nah, I think I'm good. I'll pass. Then there's only one person left. Yep. Hey, any other thoughts on this one? Uh, nope. I think I'm good. All right, moving on. Chapter 274, Oratorio. In the past, Gunfort contemplated if they were in the wrong for inhabiting Upper Yard while the Shandians want to reclaim their land. It was at this time Enru took over. Back in the present, a group of Skypean children talk about how Konus and Pagia are bad people for not obeying the Kami, unaware of Enru's plans for the country. Konus is desperate to get the word out after learning the truth from the Kami's former worker. Back in Shindora, Enru is amused that the others think that they can stand against him. He tells them that he wants to return to the endless forest and doesn't want to stay on this meager patch of land. The uh, land uh, in the sky is unnatural and must be destroyed. 
As Gonfor shouts to Enru that there are no commies, just humans. Uh, Enru has no regards for humans as he tells Gonfor that he disposed of his former followers this morning after they finished building his Ark because they rebelled against him when they found out his intentions. Outraged, Gonfor attacks Enru, but it's no use as he's defeated by 20 million volt Vari. Enru asserts that he truly is a Kami. After witnessing this, Robin realizes Enru must have the Rumble Rumble Fruit, which is generally considered to be invincible. Now that the survivors are down to five, Enru invites him to join him on, uh, in his new paradise. Robin wonders what would happen if they refuse, which confuses Enru as to why. He thinks Robin is trying to manipulate him to not destroy the country because of the Golden Bell. Suspecting that they were both thinking the Golden Bell is in the same location, he decides he doesn't need to keep her around after all. Robin is defeated as Enru attacks her with lightning. Another uh, shocking chapter. I see what you did there. <laughs> yeah, so what do you think of Enru's uh, Oh my here? gosh. This guy is so evil. <laughs> like... And endless virus, like that doesn't even sound that great. <laughs> it's just like endless land, like that's pretty boring, bro. <laughs> this island, this like Skype is awesome, but endless virus sounds less awesome. Anyways, no, yeah, I think that <laughs> his sinister plot comes to light, and just like how evil and uh selfish he is yeah that's how i was thinking too yeah if you didn't hate him before you definitely hate him now <laughs> yeah so up here land is a scarcity so it's it's more valuable than the clouds to them because the clouds are just kind of what everybody has and what everybody's used to whereas like the land is unique to this like one little patch but and he's like well i know there's somewhere that has land as far as I can see. That's where I want to go. So if you think this little patch of land is valuable, like this is even more valuable. We can go like to the endless virus. And to him, he thinks it's going to be like a paradise. And he's like, oh, it's, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be benevolent and you you can join me since you survived this much. Um, you are now my uh, my chosen like five. You can come with me. And yeah, that's some like survival of the fittest. Like we're yeah. starting a new civilization. Like come with me. Like that's yeah, exactly. He literally is playing God. Yeah, only the worthy can can come live with God. Yeah, it's messed up. Yeah, none of them are interested in going to live with them anywhere. So <laughs> yeah, pretty intense. I think on a later note, this is the first time. Uh, this it was like near the end of this volume that I realized that his ears are super long. Mm. Did you notice that? I thought yeah. it was part of like his hat at first. Like I thought he had kind of like a hat that had like tassels on it. Um, <laughs> but at some point in this volume, I realized that those are actually his earlobes. Mm, yeah, They're just super long earlobes. <laughs> He's got like, a little like earrings on the end. <laughs> yeah, with little earrings on the end. I thought that was part of his hat. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if he's ever going to use those drums and part of his uh, technique. I don't know. Don't find out. <laughs> and that we do get the moment here where Robin recognizes that he must have the rumble rumble fruit. Right. It's not sound good. Yeah. So she she knows kind of what they're dealing with. So she knows like how how deadly this one is. Yeah, it's not. That's not good. Yeah. So we have um, gone for and Robin both go down in this chapter yeah particularly worried about gan for because um he got the extra voltage mm. that was not good it's also wearing a metal armor like that probably isn't good yeah that probably made it worse yeah <laughs> that's yeah that's bad real bad he's looking pretty rough yeah and then we have like this whole moment where the children are playing and one that the children's um their their dad is the one that we saw in the woods earlier who told the truth to, to Conus about Andrew's plans. Mm. 
but he was talking about how his dad works for Enderu and like how his dad's so great and how Konos um, and Poggy are bad people because they don't listen to the Kami, but my dad's a good guy. Um, so like this is kind of like the perception of like the villagers, or at least this is what the children are getting. So they're kind of like buying into this because that's what they're kind of raised to believe, I guess. So we're kind of mm-hmm. seeing how, uh, how how that comes into play. If like you don't listen to the Kami, then you know you're considered to be a bad person, and they're kind of being like shunned. Yeah, and I think that's a nice touch that we kind of get that perspective. Mm-hmm. We kind of got it in the in the beginning when um, they originally got on the on the the Milky Road, and then Conus brought them to send them to the sacrificial altar, right? Uh, but it, it's cool getting that perspective um, from like these innocent children, you know, who like, and you know, they're just following the ways that they're they've been taught, right? It's kind of sad. Yeah, they're just kind of like saying like what they've been told and like kind of like reciting it back. Mm-hmm. Man, I wonder who's going to make it through this because like we know that the zap is has the capability of incapacitating people, but we haven't necessarily seen it kill a ton of people yet. Um, and we all know Oda hates killing people. <laughs> 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 so i'm curious to see how many actual casualties come out of this yeah i mean i'm sure somebody must have died out of the 81 right someone must have died like i, I thought for sure like the people that get the wrath of god like i don't I don't think people are surviving those <laughs> right like the beams from the sky i don't know yeah i mean we'll, we'll have to see how that plays out guess so guess so but it doesn't look good. No, it does not look good. <laughs> I mean, we're down. We're literally down to five people. We started with what? I don't even remember what the starting number was, but like it's, uh, 81. 81. Yikes. Not all those people are zapped. A lot of people, <laughs> a lot of those people were just murdered in cold blood. So. And Andrew took out like 20 of them all at once, though. Brutal. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Even his own, uh, yeah, quote unquote, followers. <laughs> yeah, I think they'll pull through. <laughs> but who knows? Man, yeah. the arrogance on this guy. Yeah, we get like his, his true feelings about how he feels about people in general, and just like how he feels like he's so far above them, and how they're like, uh, like basically insects to him. Mm-hmm. So he has like no regard for. Yeah, human this is life. all a game. This is all a game for him. It's messed up. Yeah, the last thing I wanted to mention is uh, once again we have a music themed chapter title. So an, orator- uh, an oratorio is a large scale musical work for orchestra and voices, uh, typically a narrative on a religious theme. Oh, there you go. And we're giving his spiel, his, <laughs> his beliefs. Yeah, and we've seen mantra described as like people's voices. And mm-hmm. how voice have been fading out. So we can say that maybe those, those people are the the voices of the oratorio. Damn. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Just kind of spitballing here. Hey, it sounded it sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's wrap up the volume but before we get there we get the next part of the cover story ace's great search for blackbeard volume three gathering information ace asks the locals if they've seen blackbeard guessing not meanwhile the chef in the background still like yo (laughs) (laughs) i'm excited to see where ace's uh story goes yeah and I like how he's describing Blackbeard by like putting like his hand up to his chin and be like, all right, he has like a face like this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and then the chef has a, a PL apron on for uh, so, uh pasta pasta lake. Pasta lake. Pasta lake. <laughs> Blackbeard, you know he's the guy with the black the black beard <laughs> he makes his anger face all the time yeah yeah he makes this anger face 
All right, chapter 275, Divina Commedia. Robin has fallen to Enru. Zoro catches her before she hits the ground. Zoro attacks Enru and Wiper quickly joins in. Wiper is shocked that Enru was unaffected by his burn bazooka blast. Enru tells him that there is no need to continue fighting as they can join him on this journey to the endless farce. Zoro has no interest in going, following up with another attack. This time, Enru catches two of his blades and zaps him. Enru arrogantly talks about how humans are creatures that were made to bow down to the kami. Wiper is also not interested in anything Enru has to say as he jumps on him and prepares a blast with his reject dial. To Enru's surprise, Wiper says he's equipped the shooter with Sea Prison Stone to negate Devil Fruit powers. Enru is not concerned at first since a blast from the reject dial at this point would kill Wiper too. Unfortunately for him, Wiper is ready to die if it means taking the kami with him. Wiper blasts him as Enru begins to panic. The others look on at Enru's body, wondering if he's truly dead. Crack! Ba-bump. Ba-bump. Enru managed to shock himself to restart his own heart. Now standing once again, Enru asserts that people don't fear the kami. Fear is the kami. Damn. <laughs> what a line. After resuscitating yourself. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, that was so, awesome. Enru, Enru died. And then just brought himself back. Damn. <laughs> Invincible. Really smart thinking, though, by Wiper using the C prism. Yeah. That was so, a great callback. Because I was yeah. like, what are they going to, like, what's what's the play, you know? And that's that was a good one. And it almost worked. It did work. Yeah. But Kami's like, no, I'm invincible. I don't know if you saw that in my title or not, but I'm invincible, so I can't die. <laughs> yeah, so kind of how we talked about... That was about... a great final line, though. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And then, like, People like the panel... Fear. fear is the comedy. Yeah, the panel layout, too, is, like, really, like, so uh, driving it home. But, yeah, like, the, yeah. the Shandian seemed to have... Um, good knowledge about the devil fruits. So it seemed like they would have had no way to actually defeat Enaru, but Wiper actually had a very legitimate like way to counter Enaru. So um, his his uh, dial shooter that he used had the sea prism attached to it. So he was able to negate Enaru's powers to the point where he could get the blast off without Enaru, you know, dodging it with his uh, his Logia powers. And then Wiper is also ready to lay his life on the line here by uh, using the reject dial, even at the expense of, the expense of his own body. Um, again, like the only thing that matters to him is taking out Enru, even if it costs his own life. Yeah, he's come this far. He's getting it done, one way or another. And uh, I like the the moment at the beginning of the chapter where Robin's falling, and then Zoro jumps in yes. and catches her. Yeah, I was going to mention that. She hit That's the such a great moment. <laughs> that was so great that shot of him catching her is so good yeah and the shot of her falling is pretty intense too like yeah the whole build up to that is wild yeah the kami has some good lines in this one for sure just like his arrogance and uh when he goes into the like for humans death is their ultimate fear that whole bit yeah i think they're building up Enru really well, and he's become an incredibly hit, like hated villainous character, um, and incredibly formidable as well. And I'm really liking him as a villain. Like, um, yeah, he's quite the I force. So much, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like he's such an arrogant, inconsiderate um, character. Yeah, and he who truly thinks himself to be a god. Yeah, like he. He doesn't take the lives of the other people like seriously. It's like he's arrogant, but I feel like he's arrogant in a different way than like Crocodile was. Crocodile was like arrogant and like in his in himself, like he was um, very confident in his own abilities and his ability to be smarter than everybody else. So I feel like Crocodile was like very confident in that way, whereas Enru is confident in his his power. He feels that his power makes him have the right to do as he pleases like the, the his true power is 
basically all he needs as like a free ticket to be like i get a pass to do whatever i want so he has like fine yeah. like he like it's amusing to him to kind of toy with the, like these people that are like basically just play things for him and that's where um his his villainy comes from is that that sense of entitlement and just lack of like regard for human life yeah like he honestly believes he is a superior being to yeah. everyone like not even on the same level as everyone right. else and then when like everybody says that they don't want to go with him like he's like at first like that confuses him he's like wait why, why wouldn't you want to come with me i'm amazing like, right. like I, I'm giving you a gift. Like he sees that as like a gift, and everybody's like, "No, like you're you're terrible." Like, <laughs> yeah, come with me to the promised land. Put this uh, fighting, yeah. Uh, so so ignorant, arrogant, and ignorant. Man, it's really it's really shaping up to be an epic fight. It yeah. seems like all the cards are out, but. I don't know, because I feel like Wip Wiper doesn't have another one of those attacks in him. Yeah, because that's coming at the expense you know, we of his nervous. own... We were nervous that this was going to last through this attack. Yeah. Like, how much more can he Which take? he seems to... Right, like, he seems to have weathered it, but at a cost. Yeah. We need a rubber man to ground everyone. <laughs> <laughs> ground himself. Yeah, we've seen Luffy struggle with Logia users in the past. Yeah. So that, that's something that uh, you know, we have to consider. I think, I don't know, I think this one's going to work out better for him than the other one, though. Than Sand. <laughs> yeah, I guess we'll see. <laughs> I guess we'll see. I have my theories. <laughs> yeah, um, quite the finale, though. Yeah. Uh, so this one is not so much uh, musical themed, but this um, the title of this chapter is in reference to Dante uh, Dante's Defying Comedy, which includes uh, you know Dante's Inferno, um, and Paradiso, and uh, was it uh, Pur Purgatorio? Purgatory. i have read it. Yeah, I've only read in Inferno. So um, you said this is a reference to that. Yeah. So th the Dante poem is called the Divine Comedy. It translated to English, but in, um, in Italian, it would have been Divina Commedia. Mm. And it's basically where um, there's, you know, where Dante, you know, he, he is guided um, by this poet Virgil um, through basically the, the afterlife. Like uh, he goes through, uh, through hell, he goes through like the, the seven circles, and then he makes his way through like purgatory, and he goes uh, to heaven. So it's, it's kind of like his journey through, like, it's kind of like a warning to people, like, this is what you could go through. And, like, that's mm -hmm. kind of like the, the takeaway between it. Um, I mean, the takeaway from it. Uh, but like I said, I haven't I haven't read the other parts. I've only read the Inferno part. But I feel like Inferno is, like, the most popular mm -hmm. yeah, part of the story. Of yeah. Everyone's heard of it. Interesting. But this one, I think it's maybe more, like, on the nose. Where it's, like... um comedy not in the sense of like haha this is really funny but kind of like cruel fate like laughing at them because mm -hmm. it seems like there's something they can do to stop the, this divine being um, yeah, so like, like even though joke. when they win yeah it's like a sick joke they win and he's still not defeated there's something they can do to stop him right yeah oh man I can't wait I can't wait <laughs> this arc's been so good yeah I, I feel like I said that after every volume of skypea but i've i've been loving this <laughs> arc so much well there's uh more to go so we'll uh yeah. keep on trucking you can tell we're nearing we're nearing the end we're nearing the boss battle boss battle round three four <laughs> we'll see how many times luffy gets defeated by ender though yeah see how many more attempts it takes him to get out of that snake <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Plot twist: Luffy never it's leaves really the snake. <laughs> yeah, the rest of the series takes place in the, the rule of the sky. <laughs> yeah. Well, now that it's cooked, he can eat his way out of the snake. <laughs> <laughs> That's a morbid image. <laughs> On that joyful note, that will conclude this week's episode <laughs> of the We Are Reading One Piece podcast. <laughs> 
<laughs> you can find this episode wherever podcasts are found at We Are Reading One Piece Podcast at Buzzprout.com or on our YouTube channel at We Are Reading One Piece. This is a spoiler free channel up to you where we have recorded the podcast. So if you're new to the series, you can visit the channel there. You can also find me and this podcast on my YouTube channel at Pirate King Codex for various One Piece content. Next episode, we'll be discussing Volume 30, Capriccio. I've been Joel, and I've been joined by Evan. Hello. Join us next time where <laughs> Luffy eats himself out of a snake. <laughs> That's uh, Evan's official prediction. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. All right, well, be sure to uh, bring along all of your hopes and dreams, and we'll see you on the next episode.